without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Alex Van Sommer. That's quite the introduction. Thanks very much. Um, I'm actually just going to start by, um, by thanking Jonathan because uh, Jonathan uh, managed to uh, bring up a number of touch points uh, with my own ACORN experience, which were very much appreciated. Um, first of all, uh, I too, as I'm about to explain, uh, worked on the ACORN Atom uh, a bit at the beginning. Um, secondly, I um, also flunked my A-levels. And uh, so there's a theme here, which is interesting. Uh, kids in the audience, not to take this uh, seriously or to suggest in any way that that's a good idea. Um, and thirdly, we played a lot of Snapper in our house. And I mean, really, it was very important. So actually, that was really nice. So uh, thanks so much for, for Jonathan's reminiscences. Um, so um, I'm the hardware guy in this double act. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do, at least I'm going to do a talk mainly about hardware. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of how I came to become involved in Acorn and then what I went on to do with the businesses that I built. And um, the first of those um, will follow shortly. But um, just to explain uh, who I am and how I got here, which is important in sort of grounding this story. So I was actually born in the States. Um, my father, who's here this evening, graduated at Cambridge and then went to America to seek his fortune uh, and met my mother and I was born over there. And we moved back in uh, to the UK in 1971 and my family still lives in, in Bodisham and I still live uh, here in town. So Cambridge is a sort of really important uh, centre of our activities and while I was living in Bodisham as a small boy um, at the end of the 70s, uh, these characters who we of course know very well, Herman and Chris, set up Acorn and here they are in their classic publicity shot of the 70s. Fantastic. Check the, check the outfits. It's very 70s. And um, they um, essentially um, sort of escaped from the gravitational field of Clive Sinclair and set up their own business. And um, uh, Herman's a Kingsman, so uh, here they are pictured outside King's College appropriately enough. And I saw an advert in an electronics magazine for the Acorn Atom, and I thought, that's a really cool looking computer. I hadn't already ordered a different kind of computer yet. In fact, I didn't really have the means, I think, to scrape together to afford to buy one. But I showed my dad the advert and dad said, well, why don't you write to them and see if they'll give you a job there? Maybe you could work there in the school holidays or something. So I wrote them a letter saying, dear Acorn, geese a job. Signed Alex, aged 13 and three quarters. And Amazingly enough, to their great credit, um, Chris actually wrote back um, and said, well, Sonny, you're a bit young. We can't really employ you uh, right now. But why don't you come by in the holidays and we'll see if uh, we can give you something to do. So the first day of the holidays, I was on the doorstep at Acorn um, in Market Hill, down the ugly alleyway, uh, which is indeed still there. And um, then Herman was there and slightly bamboozled by the fact that this kid was on the doorstep. Uh, Chris had gone to Hong Kong to uh, source the injection moulding for the cases for the Acorn Atom. Um, and so Herman read the letter that Chris had sent me, which fortunately they'd carefully filed, and said, oh, I see we did kind of say you should show up. So <laughs> there I was. And, and the way he tells it now, which I think is, is probably legit, is that I just wouldn't leave. <laughs> and eventually he realised that he was going to have to do something to get me to leave. So he gave me an Acorn Atom. And I'm, you know, not going to lie, I was extremely amazed. Uh, and I stuck it under my arm and I got back on the bus to Boston and I took it home. And we translated a computer game, of course, um, Spackwer, the really old three character cell teleprinter game. Some of us are old enough to remember this, um, which was on the Commodore PET at the time. And um, we translated it into Atom Basic overnight. And the following morning, I got on the bus, I took my cassette tape back into Acorn. And I showed them Space War, Star Trek um, on the Acorn Atom, and they all stopped work, and they all started playing Star Trek on the Acorn Atom, and they said, you can come back. So I kept on coming, and the rest, as they say, is history. Um, so uh, for a while, I was um, able to... I, I'm sorry, I've missed out prop number one. I promised, I promised uh, Jason a perfect one-take 
our production. So here is, for the geeks amongst us, a, a authentic Acorn Atom uh, PCB, um, which I happen to have. And uh, to be fair, these probably are not that hard to get hold of, but it's really nice, I think, to have, to possess one of the, the thing. And so we're going to pass it around. So uh, please pass it around for those who care to look, because this is, after all, a geek event. So um, fondling PCBs is, I think, important. Um, <laughs> but um, it got better because uh, you will know the story, and I will not retell it. Acorn won the contract to build the BBC Micro. And um, I, uh, because they couldn't get rid of me, was still there in the holidays all the time, um, getting in the way while um, the BBC Micro was being developed. And in fact, um, I ended up wearing a T-shirt, which sadly I have lost. Um, well, I was very impressed that Jonathan had managed to remember his, uh, which said, Official Acorn Bug Hunter. And Herman had these t-shirts minted um, for people, mainly in the university, who he was basically using as slaves to <laughs> fix the bugs in his operating system. And the t-shirt was the reward. And, you know, to be fair, t-shirts are a fair currency for this kind of thing. And um, so uh, for many years, I had a much cherished Acorn Bug Hunter t-shirt. And my brother, of course, did the same. And um, we worked debugging BBC Basic and the operating system uh, with Sophie and Paul. And so that was very, uh, very satisfying period. And I have a much more rare, as they say on eBay, uh, thing, which in fact, I'm so pleased, Alan Fournier has come along. And Alan Fournier actually gave me this. I don't know if he will remember. This is a prototype BBC Micro PCB, which as you see, has no green solder resist on it, because it's the one that he was using to check the circuit layout and it has felt tip pen on it in red and blue which tells you whether they were short or um, too far apart at various places on the board and they were correcting it to make the final BBC Micro. So that is really quite a special thing and I probably one day will have to donate it here so Jason doesn't have to ask. Um, but hence we got the fantastic BBC Micro and in fact I was um, therefore so besotted with working in the uh, computer world that in the end I did indeed fluff my A-levels and come instead to work at Acorn at 17. And I survived working for two years of my life for anyone else, and that was then. Here is my baby. I mean, it's not my baby, but actually I feel this, this actually floats in front of my eyes when I lie down at night. This is the circuit diagram of the BBC Micro, and the reason that I am really attached to it is because for many years I taught a um, training course for the Acorn Training Centre on um, sort of principles of operation of the BBC Micro. How does the BBC Micro work so that service engineers could try and fix it? And so I had to know every single gate on this circuit diagram. And so to this day, you know, you can ask me questions afterwards and I can still you know, tell you what that flip-flop is there for because I had to spend my time becoming very intimate with all of the details. And, and, and so that's, it's incredibly satisfying to know how a machine works at that kind of level of detail. And it's quite a complicated machine, but part of the joy of it, as I'm sure a lot of us will agree, is that it's still simple enough that you can kind of look at individual chips and when something breaks, you can replace an individual chip and you can fix it. And that, of course, is not something that really you can do anymore because of integration into larger devices. Um, so I think it's a very, very uh, sort of seminal moment in the industry, which is probably why uh, so many of us feel so attached to these machines, because it was a time when, you, you know, as Jonathan was saying about software, when one person could design and develop and internalize in their head the whole of a game. And in the same way, Steve Ferber, who designed this machine, was able to do all of that on his own, essentially. I mean, of course, there's a supporting cast, but the kind of the, the intimate you know, design details are really something that one person largely did most of the work on. And nowadays, you know, that's just not possible. Things are too complicated. So I think that's an interesting kind of evolutionary step, but this was a moment in time. Acorn went on to develop a much cheaper version, uh, a kind of cut down BBC Micro, the Acorn Electron. And um, this time I was so persistently there that I actually managed to get my name in the ROM, which is important. And, you know, for, for, for those of us who care about these things, um, so um, every Acorn Electron has my name uh, buried inside because I too stayed up all night on some all night debugging sessions, working on fixing um, the software to get it ready for production. And in fact, the downfall of this 
um, machine was ultimately that the big single chip, which sadly an amusing software glitch has caused my red circle to move from Windows to Chromebook um, in PowerPoint, funny uh, glitch, um, but the thing with the black blob in the middle is the thing we were supposed to be looking at in the red circle, is the essentially whole of the important parts of what we were just looking on the previous page, the schematic of the BBC Micro, condensed almost entirely onto one chip by one guy who, funnily enough, said when he lay down at night, he dreamed about <laughs> the wires and the impossibility of all the interconnect that he had to do uh, to actually get everything onto one chip. And it turned out to be the most complicated ULA, that's a, an acronym for an Uncommitted Logic Array, so Programmable Chip Design. It was the most complicated one Ferranti had ever been given by any customer, and basically they couldn't actually make one if you used every single gate on the chip that worked reliably, and it did use every single gate on the chip, so they really struggled to make them. And the production problems in making those chips meant the whole computer was late for the Christmas market. And as a result, the product was actually kind of a failure, and Acorn almost got taken down by the lateness of the Electron product to the Christmas market. They ended up with a warehouse not very far from here, full of them just slightly after Christmas, which wasn't quite the effect they were looking for. So, um, as you can imagine, that was, uh, that was a bit challenging. Anyway, still, it was a quite successful machine, and a lot of people, I think, um, cut their teeth on coding on this machine if they didn't on the BBC Micro or on the Atom. Now, um, I uh, left Acorn and uh, I went to London um, in 1984. Um, as you know, the streets are paved with gold. And in 1984, if you could do things with computers, it kind of didn't matter that you were a mouthy 19-year-old and you didn't really even have to do all the work yourself. I assembled teams of friends, relations, uh, random passers-by to code various products over the years largely built on Acorn machines. Some of them quite demanding. Um, first of all, um, just to get it out of the way, I was briefly uh, a technical editor on Acorn User Magazine, so some of you may have been unlucky enough to read things that I wrote. Um, but I worked for AutoQ, the people who make the thing that tells the newsreader what to say, and this is actually incredibly valuable experience because it's super demanding. Some of us are old enough to remember Jan Leeming, who used to read the news at nine o'clock in those days on BBC One, and you couldn't show Jan Leeming the wrong words. It wasn't going to go well if your software was buggy or your hardware broke. So working for AutoCue, making teleprompters to tell the newsreader what to say live on TV was actually a really demanding product production. And I think that really helped me to understand what sort of quality control you really have to have in building these products. I just have to tell you that what we were replacing was, I'm not making this up, a person would type the script on a golf ball typewriter onto a strip of paper four inches wide, and then it would be wound by hand from one roller to another underneath a black and white CCTV camera. And that would be the script on a strip of paper with tip X and bits that were literally cut and paste. And that was the previous version and we were replacing somebody actually stood there and wound the script across so that she would see what to say. And I hope we'll all agree that doing that in software on a BBC Micro is considerably cooler. By the way, there's also an important point Jonathan referred to. Smooth scrolling vertically on the chip that's in the BBC Micro, the 6845, is really hard. What Jonathan may not know is that Hitachi produced a clone version of the chip called the 6345, which supported smooth scrolling. And I managed to find that out and stick one in and produce this product for AutoQ by retrofitting this chip, thus saving endless pain which programmers had previously had to endure. So um, I went on and built a whole variety of bits and bobs for various people, and, and I sort of got the bug for uh, running uh, my, own, my own business. Sorry, did we glitch there? Uh, okay, there we go. So eventually along comes the arm, and um, we all know uh, about the arm a bit, I'm sure. The important thing that happened in Acorn was that uh, Sophie Wilson decided the 6502 uh, was you know, really not fast enough for the next generation. She tested all the other microprocessors in the world out, and they were all found lacking. And as a result, she decided she was going to invent her own. In true programmer style, it was never going to be good enough. We could do better ourselves. So they developed the ARM design inside Acorn in the mid-80s. And eventually, it actually went into production. 
And during the time that the uh, development of the ARM chip was occurring, uh, I was actually off in London doing all this consulting stuff. But eventually, ARM itself was established as a separate company. And oddly enough, it was established um, in the barn in Swaffham Bullbeck, which I'm sure you probably know about. But two of the people who were responsible for founding it, the chief exec, Robin Saxby, and one of the chief architects, Dave Jagger, actually lived a few hundred yards down the street from us in Bottisham. So I used to be in and out of their front room having coffee. And um, they said one day, it'd be really helpful if there was a book about the arm chip. So my wife, who has also been a journalist, and I, sat down and produced this um, book, the arm book, which um, some of you may have even seen. And um, it briefly became a set text at the University Computer Science uh, course here in Cambridge, which helped sales quite a lot, I can tell you. Um, in the end, it sold a few thousand copies. It wasn't, uh, you know, a, a, a kind of Margaret Atwood level success. But um, I think the thing that I'm most proud of, and frankly still a bit annoyed about, is that some Japanese people decided to rip the whole thing off wholesale with great precision on a page-by-page -page basis and translated it into Japanese, completely without permission. And I have one copy of the Japanese translation of our book. Um, and I actually think it's kind of wonderful that anybody thought that that was important enough. And, you know, given how many arms there are in the world now, Herman has this nice statistic that um, you know, the, uh, the number of arms produced every year it now exceeds the number of chips that Intel has made in the whole of time. <laughs> and, you know, to some extent, a lot of that was driven by the Japanese um, industries, of course, around, um, you know, embedding of arms in a lot of different things, including, of course, in mobile phones. And, you know, I like to think that my uh, ripped off uh, work, uh, plagiarized into Japanese, may have contributed in some small way to the uh, growth of the uh, world uh, microprocessor industry and indeed mobile phones. So there you are. Now, um, at the end of the uh, 80s, as this arm stuff was happening, um, uh, we, a fun opportunity arose. And my father was running his own business out in Bosham, which still uh, exists to this day. And he had uh, very important resources. He had a telephone line, which he was there reliably answering, and he had a credit card machine. And my brother and I had a kind of aha moment. We said, this new ARM3 chip could be retrofitted into the old uh, arm socket, but we need somebody to take the money. So we got in touch with our dad and we sort of said, you know, how about there's a collaborative opportunity here and, uh, you know, it's a family affair, so uh, that all went splendidly. So we got into the business of making these upgrades and, and so I do also have, look, looks for props, so I also have the uh, prototype arm three upgrade. Um, so this is a very ingenious thing. Um, so an ARM2 chip in an Archimedes is in a socket, and so we managed to find this test header which plugs into that socket, and we put it on the back of a not very complicated PCB with an ARM3 chip on the top and a bit of clock and power supply conditioning, and not very many lines of code, and bingo, you've got something that you can plug in and retrofit to your Acorn Archimedes, which makes it go five times faster. And particularly satisfyingly, we did all that before Acorn managed to use their own chip in their own product. And I think that that's a good claim. And we made quite good money making these upgrades, which let people plug into their machines and speed them up dramatically. Um, and the one that I've uh, managed to find, Dad and I uh, looked it out the other day, actually has a prototype ARM3 chip from VLSI on a prototype LF1 ARM3 upgrade. So that's a, also in the you know, world rare stakes um, getting pretty good. And um, we made good money out of ARM3 upgrades and we kind of got the bug for this selling products to consumers thing. So um, a little bit later on, we moved on to the next challenge. Acorn used to have a nice piece of software for the Archimedes that simulated the microprocessor, the 8086, in a PC and allowed you very slowly to run DOS, um, much too slowly to ever run Windows, but it let you start running non-Acorn software on Acorn machines. And it, you know, it's with weary resignation that we all accept that the PC was becoming successful, undeservedly, I'm sure you all agree, um, more successful than the Archimedes. 
But the slowness of the PC emulator software was really a pain. And so uh, we decided we would go on better and do the hardware version. And this is a pretty wacky proposition. Um, basically, what we're doing is we're taking an Intel processor, we're sticking it on a board with most of the chips of a PC, but none of the peripherals. So no keyboard, no mouse, no screen, no disk drives, no network, etc. Because, of course, those were already there in the Acorn machine. And so the picture on the left is the first version uh, of this module. And yes, indeed, I do have one. And in fact, this is complete with the wires on the back. Uh, this is the original prototype. We'll send this one this way. Um, and so this runs the Intel chip until it tries to access something which doesn't really exist on that board, at which point it stops, software takes over, connects it to whatever part of the Acorn machine it needs to get what it wants done, and then gives it the answer and lets it start again. And that is a lot better than doing it all in software, but it's still not super duper fast. It has its own memory, so it doesn't have to take memory from the host. It has various connectors on the back for the printer and things like that, because it's easier to connect them directly. Um, eventually, we worked out how to fool the Windows world into uh, taking it uh, more indirectly. Um, but it's a big improvement, and it's a very satisfying thing, because um, as many of you may have tried it, it lets you run Windows in a window, and then when you've had enough of it, switch it off and shut the window and go back to running Risk OS, which, as we know, is the true path. So progressively better and better versions of this were created, and so here's the next version, um, and the next version, what you're supposed to, if, you, if you're not a hardware nerd like me, what you're basically supposed to care about as you look at successive versions of this is how many fewer chips they have on them. So what happens over time is other people make it easier for us to crush all the components down to fewer components. Um, this version also had its memory on a SIM module, which would appear in this connector here on the side. So there are no memory chips on the board because you just popped a, a little sub-PCB with memory chips on it. I didn't bother to bring it this time because you probably know what it looks like. So here is something to go this way. Um, and so progressively, we get faster and faster emulation of, of these PCs inside the Acorn machine. And this is what is nowadays called virtualization. So you're fooling the processor that you want to do the work into believing that it lives in a world which looks to all intents and purposes like the one it expects, but in fact it's all being simulated. Uh, I want to pay special credit to two other people who aren't here, but who are frankly complete geniuses and who did all the hard work. Ian Harvey was the guy who was um, the other first in computer science at Trinity, the year my brother got a first in computer science at Trinity. Um, and he is the guy who wrote all of the software that makes this possible. And David Nell um, built several versions of this um, board um, in successive iterations, including some which Acorn uh, ultimately sold. But um, I think the thing that we are probably proudest of uh, in the grand scheme of things was what became the RISC PC uh, coprocessor cards. Doing that really, really well wants to use the memory of the host computer, so not have to have any extra RAM on the board, makes the product way cheaper, and also be able to get access to a much faster processor to help do all the work. And of course, by this stage, the ARM had come along, and a RISC PC has great power to deliver that performance, but when it has a strong ARM, card in it, it really starts to motor. And that's great when you're running RISCOS, but it's also great when you're trying to provide virtualization support for the uh, PC. So in this case, I was able to go as far as you can really go with this kind of product. I managed to find a guy, and it just really could only happen in the sort of time and place in the UK. There's a chap in Glasgow who worked at IBM who designed chips for PC motherboards. So he was actually the guy who was making the chips that were used for all the IBM machines. And he left and set up as a freelance. And he started doing business in Taiwan, selling these chips to the Taiwanese PC clone manufacturers. And this guy, Fred Dart, and I connected. And I said, Fred, can you make me a single chip that will do everything that's on that circuit board on one chip? And he said, I'm not going to attempt to do the accent, but you know, the short version was yes. And we built this product, which essentially only really has two chips on it. 
One of them is the whichever processor you fancy. Uh, the green thing with the heatsink here is one possible Intel processor clone from Cyrix. And the other thing is this dirty great 50,000 gate ASIC, a single chip with everything on it. And the joy of this is you can literally have just exactly what functionality you want. And the RISC PC was designed with two slots in it for processor cards. And the first one would have your ARM card in it. And in fact, I didn't even bring one because that's kind of obvious. Um, but here is a RISC PC card, uh, RISC PC motherboard, um, and our um, 486 card slots in as well. And now you have two computers in one computer. And it really goes pretty close to as fast as a real PC does, shares all the peripherals. And actually, if you think about it, what's the, what the ARM is doing is it's providing a kind of accelerator to help the 486 do its work as fast as possible, kind of like a graphics accelerator card does. Um, and in later versions, literally exactly like a, what a GPU card does. So Ian Harvey wrote software that actually sped up all the graphics rendering in the ARM and made it look to the Windows PC like it had a graphics card plugged in. Um, this is quite big, but we're going to send it around as well. So, um, and, and in fact, the ARM chip card turns out to have um, some wiring on the back just to show that it's an authentic uh, hack up prototype um, from back in the day. Um, this, this went quite well. In fact, there became a kind of cult of upgrades. And um, the top picture, I think, is the promo picture um, from, I, I don't know if it's ours or Acorn's, to be perfectly honest. I think Acorn shipped the version with the IBM. Uh, chip in it for a while. Um, these are all the text instruments and IBM and Cyrix chips. They're, they're all generally actually the same chip, but with different people's uh, logos on the outside and obviously sometimes with a heat sink. And, and then if you want the Turbo Nutter version, you actually have one which has a fan on top because it was going so fast that it needed additional cooling and it steals some power from the disk drive sockets, which is why it has these leads on the side, just to run the fan. So, um, I have to confess to feeling slightly conflicted about these products because, as I mentioned earlier, the first thing is this is, of course, helping PCs to become more successful. And as we know, Acorn and RISC OS is the, the true path. It's actually slightly worse than that. Um, really, I think these products, to some extent, help to contribute to the end of Acorn because they enable people to start switching to running Windows more easily instead. And actually, I suspect the world was moving in that direction quite you know, uh, quickly anyway. But I do sort of feel mixed feelings about having facilitated fewer people staying in the RISCOS world and more people moving into the Windows world. But it was jolly nice to be able to run Windows when you wanted to and then drag files in and out from the Windows window and off the Windows filing system. And you know, very, some very, very cool stuff, mostly done by other people than me, just to be clear. Um, in the early 90s, um, there, was this, there was this thing called the internet, and it became clear that it was going to become quite important. And the first thing that uh, we really took hold of there was Ethernet interfaces. You wanted to be able to plug into the network. Um, the trusty uh, BBC Micro network, the Econet, uh, really wasn't fast enough for the new world. The Ethernet was the way of the future, but Acorn had a really shockingly expensive Ethernet interface card. I remember it well, it cost £400. And that's a lot for just being able to plug onto the cable behind your machine on the wall. So we were aggrieved. We said, this must be wrong. We can do better. And we managed to discover a lovely firm in Taiwan that would sell us a Ethernet controller chip for, I'm going to say, $10. And we decided we could build an Ethernet interface card that would cost 99 quid. And that felt quite a lot better than 400. So we actually set up a new business for this. It eventually became so successful that it sort of became an independent thing. Um, and these fine people, Martin Coulson and David Fell, Martin Coulson ran Atomwide for many years, which a lot of you will know of. Um, we set up Ant together and we built these cheaper boards. And the cheaper boards uh, actually went, went quite well. There are various different versions of them with various different cheap Taiwanese chips in them. And I'm, I'm pleased and um, frankly slightly smug to say that um, they got so cheap that Acorn gave up and started just buying them from us. Um, and that was very, very satisfying. That kind of proved the point. But, you know, just to be clear, the, the point was to democratize the access to the Internet and to enable everybody to get on the Ethernet. 
and, and they were really a lot cheaper. So I feel very good about that. So we made a whole variety of different shapes and sizes of these things, and um, the acute among you will be able to name which version of the computer these things go in. Uh, and so there's kind of one shape for each different generation of Acorn machine, um, and that went quite well. Um, and then there's the software thing, because of course, once you're on the internet, then you know, what are you gonna do when you get there? Well, it turns out there's this thing called a web browser, and my brother, bless him, had discovered the web browser, Mosaic, the open source web browser had been released, and in true programmer tradition, he said, it's rubbish, I'm going to write my own, and produced his own web browser, which in tribute to Mosaic, we called Fresco. And the Ant Fresco browser became the core of what later was the Ant Internet Suite, and there was also an email program. Uh, the email program supported a new um, email standard called MIME, and therefore it became known as Marcel. Some of you will get the joke. And various other bad puns uh, were packaged together to become the Ant Internet Suite. Um, and so that enabled everybody to do the things we now do all the time every day. Mail, browsing, uh, FTPs kind of fallen into disuse, but you know, that used to be how you got files back and forth. Um, and a second software product uh, called OmniClient was used to kind of mop up connectivity software for all of the other kinds of machines in the world. And a lot of other really clever people did the hard stuff here. Um, we managed to get um, Sun, so NFS connectivity, uh, Novell, uh, now, now dead, um, but um, to be fair, the, uh, the head of Novell um, is uh, Eric Schmidt, who went on to run Google, so he kind of did okay. And um, the Apple filing system, which was reverse engineered by a brilliant uh, guy in the Netherlands called John Teitgat, um, completely hacked backwards from first principles. And so we were able to connect Acorn machines to every other kind of machine that was anywhere on the network and get files back and forth. And this was incredibly useful in schools. Um, and actually, this product was so important that after I memorably went on a visit to research machines, you're supposed to boo at this point, <laughs> the deadly rivals in Oxford, um, I uh, got a call from Acorn who said, um, we're really quite unhappy about the idea that you might do any deal with research machines. Can we buy OmniClient? Um, and so I said, sure, it'll be very expensive. And, and, and they said, great, we'll pay. And uh, it became Acorn OmniClient. Um, and so that is how it became absorbed into the uh, RISCOS domain. So, you know, we put together all the bits that you need to be able to use your network once you're connected. And then um, finally, something um, very weird and wonderful happened. Um, Herman managed to bump into this guy called Larry Ellison, who runs this little software shop in California called Oracle. And he had this dream that the future was going to be that everyone, you'll be shocked to know, will connect to the central Oracle machine using what we would now call a set-top box. And he called it the network computer. And weirdly, he couldn't find anyone in California who would make it for him. Herman said, no problem, we'll make the network computer for you. And then he came back to Cambridge and of course there was a flurry of activity and eventually they realized they didn't have a web browser. So I get this phone call saying, would I like to put my web browser into this thing called the network computer? I had no idea what it was. The deal was absolutely fantastic. Oracle said, we'll pay you nothing at all, ever, for the privilege of having your software in the network computer. And I asked him to repeat that, and that was still what he said, so I put the phone down. And then I spoke to my wife, who's fortunately smarter than me, and she said, no, no, I've actually heard of Oracle. Maybe you might want to reconsider. This could go somewhere. You know, there's a bigger pond out there, and you might want to go and be a smaller fish in that. So I picked the phone up again, and I called Malcolm Bird at Acorn back, and I said, OK, we'll put our browser into this machine. And we did, and it was launched, and it was a complete failure. So I guess we could have done it for free, and it wouldn't have mattered. But what it did do was it enabled me to move on and start my next business. But that isn't the subject of this talk. Uh, that was the end of the Acorn part. Thank you very much. So we're going to take some questions. You started uh, work. It beats working. Acorn as a modular, and you very much got into the hardware side. 
So which came first? Were you already into, into electronics first and, 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 and into your schematics and, and your soldering irons? Or, or did that come after ACON? Um, good question. So at this, at this point in time, in the late 70s, early 80s, all computers were kind of hand-stitched, pretty much. And so uh, for the time I got into ACORN and collected my ACORN Atom, I was still at the salivating over magazines, but not actually having anything stage. And, um, you know, so it was incredibly important that Herman was kind enough to actually give me that machine. So I was reading Practical Electronics, some of you know, ETI, um, you know, magazines of the era. Um, uh, our household had Scientific American because Dad had worked there, um, New Scientist. And so I was reading about and trying to understand all that stuff, but actually doing it at a practical level definitely wasn't happening yet. Um, and so actually, I wisely bypassed trying to actually solder an acorn atom together myself because I, you know, that really turns out to be quite hard when you're only 14 and unpracticed, um, better than done by professionals. But um, you know, later on, I actually did, and in fact, I, one of the things I didn't show you is you know, there were eventually things that I did actually design myself, and so obviously there was some of them that I actually had to solder together myself. So this was the thing I mentioned on the slide. It's a direct drive laser printer interface, which is a, a kind of nerdy thing, but the key point is very simple. Laser printers were expensive, one of the things that made them really expensive was the software that put the image on the page, that rendered PostScript into dots. And so it turned out you could buy a much cheaper laser printer mechanism and then plug it into the computer and get the computer to do all the work. So that's what this does. This is an interface that lets you use a really cheap laser printer mechanism. And the software does all the work. And so that kind of thing, you know, I mean, I can do some, I can do some electronics after many years, but at the time, no, it was just all lust and <laughs> waiting for the right moment. Just going back to the um, BBC Micro, who was Bob? Uh, Bob Austin uh, was the guy who actually did the PCB layouts. So um, that's my friend um, Alan Fournier there at the back. Um, so Robert Austin was the man who did the very important, very skilled job of working out where each trace on the board goes. And I can tell you some only very simple things about this, which I think you can observe if you still, somebody's got the board. Um, one way of getting this started is to draw all of the lines on one side of the board horizontally and all the lines on the other side of the board vertically. And the challenge of turning that thing, um, let's just have it back, you know, of Byzantine complexity into uh, lines on a board was something that Bob Austin was really, really good at. And he did it on a big easel with um, black transfer tape and a kind of rubbed down tool at, I guess, A0, um, and then shrank it down photographically. Um, and so the reason the question's been asked is because underneath uh, the microprocessor, the 6502, on the BBC Micro motherboard, it says Bob's board, where no one will ever see it unless they are actually manufacturing or building them from scratch and the BBC Micro wasn't sold as a kit. So generally you would never have seen it. But Bob, I think you will agree, deserves to have his name on the board for being able to turn that into those lines and make the machine that we all enjoyed. Thanks for asking. Right. Um, you mentioned the electron, which I guess must be the most, the most unloved machine. So I was just wondering if you could talk about the electron for this time. So but also the euro name. Uh, that's, a really, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. Um, so <laughs> the Acorn Electron is definitely the least loved Acorn machine. And one of the reasons that it's the least loved, I think, is that it tried to do something very cheap, which was it tries to use half as many memory chips as a BBC Micro. Um, in order to keep the cost down because they were one of the most expensive components. But the way it did that was by compromising on how the video interacted with the processor, which actually was a retrograde step, and I think this is why it deserves to be unloved, um, because it made it much more like, are you ready to boo, a Sinclair Spectrum, um, and, you know, or a ZX81, uh, where what's happening is you're having to share access the memory between the processor and the video system on a kind of flip-flop basis, which results in screen flicker. 
So when you did graphics on the screen, it made nasty flickery lines while you were drawing the graphics. And I think that was a retrograde step and probably a bridge too far. It was actually a less attractive machine as a result. The ULA was a virtuoso performance by this guy, I don't know whether Alan can remember his name, a young lad who was at the university who basically just did this one job and then I think probably said he was never going to do one ever again. Um, and no, there was no ability to buy in the IP. It was basically a kind of gate level, you know, practically transistor level reverse engineering job. They basically said, how little of the video functionality of the video chip, the 6845, can we get away with? What does it do? Let's design it from scratch in as few gates as possible. And then that and as much of everything else as they could squeeze in went onto this one chip. And I mean, uh, I, the guy told me, eventually I'll probably remember his name, um, that it literally used every single gate on that device. That's just kind of basically impossible. You can't even wire them all together. You know, how, where do all the wires go? How do you, right? It's not designed to be 100% utilized. It's designed to be kind of, you know, 75 or 80% utilized. So there's room to do some joining of things together. And he dreamed it you know, to get it done, which, uh, which is, I guess, probably not all that surprising in the same stuff. So it's a really amazing achievement. And um, no, it was just done by brute force reverse engineering. Hi. Uh, lots of the projects that you've highlighted that you chose to be involved in historically, um, they've got an element of enablement or making something that's hard more easy or something that's expensive and inaccessible affordable. Uh, is this a conscious motivation or is it just a coincidence? Um, it's very kind of you to ask that question. Um, I, I, I think that um, actually, I'm not going to lie, it's probably just ruthless entrepreneurship. I think that in the end, you'll sell more stuff if what you build is things that make products go faster, enable people to use things they want to use more cheaply, um, and enable them to be accessible to the largest possible number of people. Um, I'm very happy that what we did enabled peop more people to enjoy more access to computers. I think, to be fair, the credit mainly actually goes to Acorn because Acorn machines were used in education and that ethos of trying to make computing accessible to everybody was actually the fundamental root of the BBC Micro project. That was why it existed. A very uh, wise person in the government, in the Department of Trade, made a decision that we were going to have a national project to educate everybody about computers and commissioned the BBC to commission a computer. And Acorn won, and that became the BBC Micro. But I think really the credit is probably owed there to that it really inspired decision, which, I mean, probably changed essentially the lives of all of the people in this room and made Acorn a huge financial success. And as an entrepreneur, I think what you do to be a successful entrepreneur is you spot those opportunities where you can make something faster or cheaper or easier to use because that's how you'll sell plenty of stuff. It's very satisfying that it's so, you know, enriching of people's experience as well. And because I'm not ashamed of having made some money out of doing it, because I think it actually also really did some good things. Hello, thank you for coming. Great talk so far. Thank you. One question that we can look up is the OS ROM in the BBC Micro has all the address lines going to it, even though that's of no practical use. Do you know the history behind that? So. <laughs> it's, it's not like I was waiting for this moment or anything. Um, so um, up here are, are some ROMs. I, I'm, I'm not really going to point at the schematic. I'm just joking. Uh, the, but the, uh, the answer is, is, is available. Yes. What's going on is when the machine finally went into production, the operating system was in one chip and BASIC was in one chip. But in order to be able to make those chips, a lot of iteration of the software along the way was needed. And to do that, you needed reprogrammable chips rather than fixed programming chips. So switching to jargon, instead of having a ROM, you needed an EEPROM, an electrically programmable ROM. And those were so expensive and actually for a long time not even available in the size that you needed to fill the complete basic and operating system into a single chip, that what you did was you divided them into four chips. 
And so the board has organized on it, it's around somewhere, um, four sockets in a row, which can be used for four quarters of the operating system. And then the fifth socket would have a stand in it with a PCB that sat on top and had another four sockets in a row with four quarters of the basic in them. And that way you could develop the software for the machine before it went into production in a reprogrammable form. So every time there was another bug, you could reprogram them and replace them. And that requires you to have all the address lines wired to that socket, even though the final production version of the chip doesn't need them. I guess a, a follow-up to that is that the, one of the, I, I believe some of the early BBCs were shipped with still the OS and four models. And Sorry, still with? Still with four parts of the OS roll. Right, you are right. Mm -hmm. um, was it a case that the system was set up so whichever one got finished first, you could ship with one chip and the other is full? Alan's probably better qualified. But I mean, the short answer is yes, exactly. The, but the point was that um, everything was still a moving target um, and, you know, production of these machines. I, I, I've, I've skipped past the point where I was working in customer service at Acorn and everyone in the country who had ordered a BBC Micro still hadn't got one. And every morning I would come in and we had 10 telephone lines with lights on them. And at nine o'clock, every light would light up. And until I went home again at 5.30 that evening, they would never stop. And every single one of them would be a person saying, where the hell's my computer? And when is it going to arrive? And so trying to get to the point where you could get the thing into production required all the work on both the operating system and the basic to proceed in parallel. And it was a very much moving target, which one would get locked down first and committed to a ROM chip, which requires it to be sent away, the ROM chip manufactured, and the chip supply come back, then all be fitted into boards, and then you could ship it. So to be able to be versatile, you, there's actually a whole set of jumpers and links that allow you to uh, switch around which of the sockets are doing which thing. And I'm not even going to attempt to remember, because it was quite a long time ago, exactly which versions of what came out in what order. But, but you're exactly right that ultimately, I think, I think it was that the basic got locked down first, but the operating system was still a moving target. This machine is a very, very complicated machine, not being funny or anything, but uh, it, behind here, what you can't see is that everything in the way the machine runs is about interrupts, signals that come in from different things at different times that tell the processor to go off and do something somewhere else. And there are so many of them that Paul Bond, who produced the operating system, told me at one point that they actually didn't know what the right order to service all these interrupts was. They just tried some combinations and most of them didn't work and eventually they got a combination that did work and then they didn't mess with it they just left it and that was enough to to, to satisfy um, so you know that kind of stuff requires the operating system to still be being tweaked till quite late on and every time you try and add something else you know you go from originally it was developed for eight inch floppy disks for example which you know most of us didn't need to use for very long before we got to five and a quarter inch. but when you switch to five and a quarter inch disk something would be different and maybe the software would needed tweaking and so on and so forth so there were a lot of and, and as many of you will know there were several different versions of the operating system eventually even after production and we ended up changing chips in machines for years to come to get improvements to, to come along something's contributing from the back yeah. <laughs> Okay, anybody else? Uh, let's, let's have a question for a lady. I should have tried to take a question from a lady at the beginning. Thank you. What would you be your advice for the modern youngster who really wants to get into our software? Now, there's a risk that Jonathan and I could get into trouble here if we're careless with uh, how we prioritise our, our education. Um, so my first advice would be definitely pass all your A-levels. Um, and my... Next advice would be, um, it's very interesting how games are the substrate of a lot of what drove computing. Um, and that's still true, I think. And um, Jonathan obviously did a fantastic job producing these games, which we all enjoyed. But actually, also, that enabled him to earn, earn a living. I think that's actually still a really satisfying way for young people to get involved with the computers. And there's a really brilliant series of books on Python programming, which are about writing. I think it's act the first one's actually called, someone can correct me, Write Your Own Computer Games in Python. It does what it says on the book. And it's fantastic. And, and in fact, in my household, I 
accidentally left a copy lying around on the kitchen table and never mentioned it to anyone. And strangely enough, some of my children decided that that would be a fun thing to try and went ahead and actually coded their own computer games in Python. And I think the first book teaches you to produce a version of Asteroids, which is a sort of satisfying shoot 'em up thing. And we can all go play it in a minute on different machines. And, um, and I think that that kind of hands-on approach is really what you need. And I really am a big believer in Python as being the, the right way to kind of real programming. Scratch is really good for, for young people, but, um, but Python is probably, I mean, you can get paid real money to program in Python, I think is the key thing. So, you know, that's, um, that's definitely worthwhile. And, and so I think I, I would really encourage people to code their own computer games in Python, and then, you know, they can graduate from there. But I think these days it's much harder to put your own electronics together at any kind of scale, it's just kind of not an accepted thing and it's actually a bit difficult to get hold of the parts. One of the great things about the Raspberry Pi is that it does embrace the hardware hacking world and you can code your own computer games in Python on a Raspberry Pi. So for me, that would be pretty much the perfect outcome, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. when we were looking at the BBC board that you said around, I couldn't see any evidence of like the tube on there. Was that something that actually came a bit later on in the design? Or did somebody have this brainwave one day that we're going to be able to attach additional things? So the tube, which connects the second processor, for those of you watching in black and white, um, the, the tube uh, on a BBC Micro is nothing, interestingly. It's just a connector with wires going to it and that's it. And so you're, you're, you're sort of right. I think there was a, there was a feeling that um, they, they, they sort of knew what they wanted to do, but they hadn't quite finished doing it yet. And so the right solution was just to leave a connector that had all the wires on it and stop there. And it does cost a bit of money to put the connector on, but by this stage, we kind of designed the case and the connectors are all along the front. It was gonna look a bit odd if we didn't have all of them, so we had all of them. And then you do all the rest of the work in the box that you sell as the add-on, and that way you can basically figure out all the details later. So, so it's actually quite important in a way that that connector has no chips associated with it at all. It is literally just some address and data lines, a handful of control lines and some power, and, and that's it. And that lets you do everything else you want to do further on down the line when you figured out exactly what it is. And eventually they did, and they made another big custom chip that sat in between and joined the second processor on, yeah. Uh, uh, I didn't have a question before, but then someone mentioned the tube. Uh, I'm not sure if I saw it on YouTube. But um, ching. <laughs> um, but do you know where the uh, name tube came from? There's a lot of speculation about it. No, just thought I might try and consult an expert. Um, yeah. All right, great. The, it turns out the chief does so. We'll hand him the microphone. What are the things that goes to the connector? Uh. What's, what's the things that go to the connector? All the address and the data lines. Buses. Yeah. Bus. Chew. <laughs> you heard it here first. Okay, there you go. It's not an English thing if it doesn't have a pun. Yeah. Um, how would you later on? I actually remember if it was. It's good, it's good enough for me. Yeah. Uh, that's, it's got that kind of Monty Python feeling to it. I can definitely get by that. I can definitely buy that. Okay. Um, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, maybe that's a, a, bit, a bit trivial, so perhaps we'll leave. Oh, no, come on. No, no, come on. We're going to close on trivia. We came for trivia. Um, so, so why is there no 5 volt power on the 1 megahertz bike? Oh, wow. That's... <laughs> 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 That's very trivial. Uh, the answer, I'm afraid, is I have absolutely no idea. But my guess is this. You don't need it to make the thing on the other end of the connector work. And actually, if you don't provide it, then the person designing the thing on the other end of the connector can't overload the power supply. Okay? It's a device, this is a guess, is it, but it is a handy device for avoiding people just going <laughs> on the power supply and hoovering out as many volts, uh, as, much, as much current as they like. And, and actually, therefore, just, you just buffer the signals, you provide ground, which you have to have to be able to keep the signals connected, and you stop there and you force the designer of the peripheral to provide their own power, and that way it can have as much or as little power as it wants. It's a guess, but there it is. Okay, folks, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to stay around and chat. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you.